Hello and welcome to SpaceX ITS upgrades and re-entry testing based on feedback and also the need to try and bring the ship back down into the atmosphere. I have made numerous changes to the ITS. It could also be referred to as the BFR uh, referring to the launcher and MCT or ICT for the ship but I'll just call it uh, ITS collectively and call it ITS launcher and ITS ship and ITS tanker too. Um, there aren't too many changes to the launcher itself. I did remove the lander legs since people noted that there are no lander legs, though that really does make it hard to land the first stage in Kerbal Space Program. Uh, the Griffins are here. Uh, but yeah, I have put other things. I've added more, more uh, RCS ports to control it, and a heat shielded nose cone to protect the controller. And otherwise, the launcher is pretty much uh, as it was. The real innovations have come with the ship. And here you see uh, complex RCS blisters. Uh, we have uh, lots and lots of heat shielding. I've gone into the configuration files and basically added heat shielding to everything. Now, the shape of this element here, the aerodynamic element if you will, isn't exactly the same shape as it is in the renders from SpaceX and there's some smoothing that I still need to do but this provides me with the aerodynamic sort of situation that will allow me to hopefully bring it through the atmosphere. Now the land legs obviously are inside here so they're not quite functional I, I think they won't collide with the body when they extend, so maybe it's alright, but obviously they're supposed to be pistons, uh, and so they'd come straight out through here, and I, I would like to have proper lander legs for that. Anyway, uh, so we have RCS ports uh, to maintain orientation, but as far as I can tell from testing, uh, these will not hold it at the 40 degree orientation that I would like to re-enter Earth's atmosphere with. So that's a downside, but they can basically do 20 once they hit the the main part of the atmosphere. And in testing, so so far I've, I've done some testing, and I think I've gotten it to a point where it won't all blow up. Uh, I think my last edits will do it, but it's not a guarantee that what I've done will work. Uh, so that's where we're at. Now this is a service bay. It is actually a stock service bay scaled up using tweak scale, and I edited the texture to make it white. So I basically got rid of the default texture. Couldn't do anything about the handlebars, but basically we have a little thing here. That's the ISR unit. Oh, I forgot to mention we do have ISRU stuff. Uh, you, you might notice the drilling units here. And yes, I've configured the drilling units uh, so that when they drill for ore, we can convert it to methane. Um, if we take a look, though we need a lot of power for that. Uh, where is the, here's the ISRU unit. You notice uh, it can convert ore to water, it can convert ore to oxygen, liquid methane, liquid hydrogen, LOX. Uh, I did, uh, I based the numbers off of if it was drilling a certain kind of ore, uh, and if you could turn that into its constituent elements. Uh, so yeah, it's semi-legit, if you will. It takes a lot of power, though. So we've got that, we've got ore containers here radial ore containers. Those will blow up probably. I haven't added any heat shielding to them. They're the only parts on here I think that I haven't added heat, shield, heat shielding to. Lots of heat shielding uh, to everything. Now this is a nifty little thing. Uh, these are now fairings and so if I manage to pull one off before... yeah okay there we go. So we have an interior here now. Uh, it's not quite like their uh, nifty little render, but the Kerbals can go from, well, I guess you could call them floor to floor, or just, these are really just places for me to attach things to, since they'll just be floating about in here. Uh, but here we have a planetary greenhouse, another planetary greenhouse. This is a planetary central hub, and these are actually uh, water purifiers down here. Uh, we have additional life support in here. Uh, here we have a life support. Assuming that the, uh, the recycling units and the greenhouses, these uh, water purifier and uh, greenhouses work at about 90% efficiency, uh, we could have enough supplies for 100 Kerbals for like 180 days. Uh, if it's 80% efficiency, we have enough for 90 days for 100 Kerbals. Uh, so that's sort of the level we're at right here. I don't know if I could actually fit 100 Kerbals in here. Uh, it'd be tight, but in theory, 
and here we have space for other things. This is an extra tank just in case we have to, for balance reasons, move up the fuel from here to here uh, to make sure that we stay oriented properly when hitting the atmosphere. But I don't think that will be necessary, so maybe that's superfluous. Oh, I forgot to show you the extendable docking ports. Must do that. So, um... So now I've added little cylinders on the docking ports to make them a little bit more legit looking. I suppose uh, while we're at it, I'll show you the tanker version and also another version I was working on that I haven't been so successful with. So the tanker is fairly simple. It just means that we don't have the windows on the, on the thing and instead we have fuel tanks in here and in here. Uh, that, that's it. That's all you have to do. Uh, the fuel tanks fit fine, and uh, we have the fuel that it is supposed to carry up, uh, so no problems there. So altogether, this has the 2,500 tons of fuel that uh, Elon Musk said that this version would. However, I was much more interested in making a cargo version of the ITS, and this is a lot more tricky. Um, first of all, because Infernal Robotics keeps removing my groups, but basically this is the idea. So these are, these are still interstage fairings and I really wish uh, that bit on top would stay stable with just one fairing but it turns out it doesn't. And so these are fairings that were originally placed with this and then I pressed uh, shape lock. They're really heavy, they're five tons a piece. Um, and then we've got an infernal robotics hinge and then a sort of fake one of these interstage decouplers to attach them to. I don't know how else to do it. But the problem is, uh, A, if you have all three of them open up, that bit falls down. And if you have only one bit uh, open up, it tends to flop around a lot. Uh, you can't launch it. it just uh, The hinge is not strong enough to keep it in place. And uh, so yeah, that, that, that's where I'm at right now. But this is a really interesting idea. I could really see possibilities for using this, right? Uh, or even if only the top one opens up, that'd be a great thing. But putting it on the launch pad, it, it doesn't seem to be very stable. So you see, uh, things are proceeding. All right, but let's bring out the ITS ship and see how that works on re-entry. All right, so here we are, and we have Jeb in the, in the sort of cockpit that we have right at the top there. Uh, that uh, is actually the root part of the whole thing. And here we go. SAS on. Ignition. And launch. I did make an initial attempt to improve the plumes. I just copy. I just used the Carolox lower real plume configuration. So our plume is looking a little bit nicer, but probably it could do with some tweaking. It could definitely do with some tweaking. Now, we do not have a very heavy payload up there. You know, it's supposed to be able to carry 300 tons of payload to low Earth orbit. So we actually technically have more fuel than we need, and we'll see when it doesn't carry 300 tons. Right now it's just carrying the life support stuff, and the ISRU, which is not very heavy, and the recycler units, and the greenhouse greenhouses. So we'll see how much Delta V we have left after getting to orbit like that. I will reserve the fuel for the return of the first stage, though I won't be doing that part here. That will be a challenge for another time. I'd say the plume is looking pretty good here. That's a nice plume. And I'm gonna save 15 seconds worth of stage time. That's probably a little bit more than they would save, but we've got plenty of surplus. Okay, shut down. That's a lot of Delta V we've got left. I'm sure that's more than they would have. And ignition. And 
the second stage is on its way. So, we obviously have way more Delta V than we need to make orbit. And we will want to dump that Delta V to make the re-entry realistic. Because normally it wouldn't have much spare fuel when it's coming back into the atmosphere. So we'll boost our orbit uh, higher than necessary. And then uh, bring it down again. We'll retro burn to bring it down again in order to just sort of dump the fuel. I think we can roll to a proper orientation. Somebody pointed out that uh, Elon Musk did mention differential thrust with uh, the vacuum engines, so they wouldn't have to control with the surface engines except on landing. But of course, in KSP, differential thrust, well, that to do it properly, you require a particular mod, and uh, that doesn't necessarily work well, well with uh, realism overhaul. At least last time I tried it, it didn't. So, so yeah. I'll just use the sea level. Certainly that would provide more buffer and margin for uh, for the real thing. Okay, so we're gonna boost our apoapsis a little bit further out. You can see we have, we've made, basically made orbit. We've got 3,700 meters per second to spare, which means we could transfer to the moon and probably make orbit around the moon too, but then we'd be out of fuel so we couldn't come back. But uh, that's how much how much fuel this has when it's not carrying payload but just carrying life support. But we will have a harsh re-entry. So now I'm going to actually flip it around. And while we're still close to periapsis, we will retro burn. Right now the RCS system seems to be turning it quite quickly, but trying to hold pitch is another matter entirely. It was mentioned that they plan to use uh, pure gas instead of actually igniting the methane and oxygen on the RCS. I have no idea how it's going to hold pitch if that's the case. So we're bringing the apoapsis down and also bringing our periapsis down to where we need it to be. Alright, well I've got the periapsis to 62.5 kilometers, which is fine, but the apoapsis is a little bit higher than I was uh, trying for, but I guess uh, we will test that. So we're going to be hitting the atmosphere with a little bit more force than I was looking for. I was just trying to go from low Earth orbit, uh, sort of like the tanker version, uh, which would rendezvous with the ship in low Earth orbit, transfer the fuel, and the tanker would come back. But uh, this is a little bit higher than that. Still not, you know, returning straight from Mars or anything like that. I'm going to have it point just 40 degrees pitch above our current velocity. Now we need to pump the fuel up for center of mass issues. And then when we are ready to go tail first, we'll pump it back into this tail tank. At least that's how I'm doing it. I know that's not how they're going to do it, but that was the most convenient way to go about for this. And uh, if it's above a certain amount of remaining fuel, we'd have to use that tank inside the service bay. But as you can see here, we have very little fuel left. We're talking about maybe 3% of our fuel remaining, less than 3%. So uh, we are experiencing some aerodynamic lift, even though we don't have much of a wing to speak of. I have endeavored to make uh, as much of a wing as possible. Uh, one thing I didn't do, I, I did uh, play a little trick. I do have some control surfaces here, but they're minimally effective. Certainly at this height, they're completely useless. As you can see, at 87 kilometers, the RCS is no longer good enough to hold the pitch at 40 degrees, so we are experiencing some pitch down here. The tank is glowing red. 80 kilometers on the right side, we are slowing down. Surface velocity is going down. Apoapsis still very high. Periapsis is increasing. 75 kilometers 
and we have our first overheating warning. It looks like it's on the central engine cluster, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Yeah, I'm not too sure why that engine cluster would have any overheating at all. That's just weird. Okay, vertical speed approaching zero. We're getting close to our periapsis. Remember I said it's 62.5 kilometers, but now it's gone up because of the lift. So we, we'll probably skip for a bit. We might skip out entirely and have to go around again. Um, that explosion was an ore tank, so that's nominal. I mentioned that I did not put extra heat shielding on the ore tanks. And uh, probably for the final version of this, I'll just have the ore tank inside the service bay. Uh, that was the other ore tank. And this is one reason why a 40 degree pitch is better. Uh, at a 20 degree pitch, you get actually more lift. Uh, at 40 degrees, you get more drag and so uh, you're less likely to skip out. Uh, between 20 and 30 is where you get your best lift. Uh, between 0 and 20 is where you get your best explosions. So we're, we're still in explodey territory as you can see from the overheating warnings. My bet at this point is that we are going to have to go around again. Mm, something is overheating. Ah! Graphite radiator is overheating. That's confusing. Part temp is pretty, pretty bad. Again, the radiators are just for looks to provide this, uh, the black area that uh, we see in the pictures. I wonder why uh, this side in particular seems to be overheating more. There's, the lander leg here is also overheating here. Maybe it's the RCS thruster blowing at it? Okay, we are now in space again, and we've still got a lot of apoapsis to burn off. I'll correct our periapsis once we get to our apoapsis and bring it back to 62.5 just as a test number to see how things work. And consistency is good. We will uh, again have Smart ASS hold the pitch to the same level, even if it can't really hold that, just to uh, see how it works. Okay, we are below 80 kilometers. It is once again not possible for the RCS to hold the nose up to where it's supposed to be. And we'll see how much drag we get this time. The most serious region of heating is like around 50 kilometers, but it all depends on how fast we're going at that point. We've once again hit periapsis. I don't know. We are going up again. Alright, so maybe third time's the charm. We're certainly going to try and find out. Though this is very important information for me as far as uh, what kind of altitude we can try and re-enter on the first pass with. So obviously uh, 1.9 kilometer, oh, 1,900 kilometer apoapsis is a bit too much, at least with our current RCS configuration. And again, these RCS are configured to burn the methane oxygen. They have a 350 ISP. They're not just shooting out the gas. Now, some of you will probably suggest that I use a lower periapsis. So that will be a very obvious suggestion. But the reason I picked 62.5 is because that's the periapsis I used for space shuttle re-entries in KSP. Now that's not what they really had for the space shuttle re-entries, but in KSP that's what I found to work with various space shuttle models. And so that's why I started off with that. Now bringing it down lower, well we could try that, but keep in mind that the ore tanks which were placed here, which shouldn't be in the flow of anything, but weren't, uh, weren't fully heat shielded, uh, certainly didn't have like shuttle tiles on them, uh, have already blown up. So 
so we might not want to risk going lower after all. That's the rub there. And of course our main tank is now glowing pink. Now given the number of times we've had to go around, uh, there's no way we're going to end up uh, anywhere close to Cape Canaveral. If you uh, go around one time, there's a chance that you can come back to Cape Canaveral if you if you manage to do a bit of a roll and uh, well possibly if you have a larger wing than this the space shuttle could have because it has a large wing this I don't know if it could uh, go straight back to Cape Canaveral after one orbit but uh, that's a possibility uh, right now our orbit does not allow for that and we may end up in a random location in the middle of the Pacific as far as RCS feel we're not bad but there is the matter of balance and so we would like to have enough to put into the tail fuel tank to counterbalance us and make sure that we go tail first as we head towards the ground also that happens to be uh, the amount that we really need in the tail tank to do that happens to be about the same as the amount we need to use for the engines to touch down safely uh, so not a coincidence there. Okay, well this time I have confidence that we're not going to escape the atmosphere. We're only at 74 kilometers. Periapsis probably will get up to uh, 69, 70. But Apoapsis is going down quickly. We're getting a lot of lift with this thing. You wouldn't think so, but we're getting a lot. These are B9 procedural wings. They should be properly configured for uh, Fair Mirror Space Research. Far. Far could tell us all the things. We're going at Mach 25.9, by the way. And uh, lift 190 kilonewtons, drag 220 ish. Alright, we are decisively suborbital now. Still going up, though. I consider this okay. It's not ideal, but it's okay for. Uh, for burning off speed so going up like this means that we're reducing our speed but the reason why it's not ideal is because we can't really predict our landing location if we have random bits of lift in the middle of our descent profile now the RCS ports would have more effect if I could put them up here somewhere the problem is that these are procedural fairings you can't really place things on them. The way these windows are mounted is actually radiator panels underneath the structure here. There are radiator panels right underneath and those windows are actually attached directly to them. The radiator panels happen to match the curve of the fairings quite nicely. That's why I picked them. Somebody suggested them during a Twitch livestream. Just a reminder, there are no reaction wheels involved on this. Uh, I know it's uh, easy to forget that this is realism overhaul, so there is no reaction wheel to hold the pitch up. Uh, it is purely RCS and aerodynamics. Alright, we are headed back down now, and we are here. So we're getting closer to the west coast of the Americas. Uh, actually, sort of skirting this line here formed by Central America. Currently our trajectory reads like that, but we know we're going to get some more lift along the way down, so maybe a a any part of Central America and South America will end up being a valid landing spot, maybe. Alright, we are at 82 kilometers, and I see our first overheating indicators. Looks to be the Falcon landing legs in there and there which is interesting because of course they are completely shielded from the airflow right now unintentionally I mean obviously uh, it would be better if they were on the outside but right now it's no good reason for them to be overheating though it's worth pointing out that uh, the ITS ship doesn't have a body flap like the shuttle had Right, it doesn't have a flap to protect these engines below here. So far G-forces have been mild. 
It'll uh, show the G-forces on the way up. We maxed out 5 Gs on the way up. But uh, Jeb has not experienced high G levels on the way down yet. Right now we're at uh, 0.18 Gs in climbing. The peak G load is usually around like 30 kilometers altitude. Once again, the central engine cluster is having problems. I added heat shielding to these guys, but I think I forgot that central cluster. So these guys have much more heat shielding than that unit does. Alright, now going up a bit. Below 7,000 meters per second. I uh, sense some aerodynamic issues. We might have dropped below the amount of methane and oxygen that will properly balance us. So I'm going to try and pump it into this tank inside the... If I can get to it. Inside the service bay. Which will move it further up. Mm, it also seems to pitch us down more. Stop, stop. I don't like that. Seems like it's a delicate situation here. Yeah, so the reason why I think there's aerodynamic issues going on is because of the side slip. You can see it's wiggling from side to side, not just up and down. And you can see the slide slip angle is fairly high, anything above one. And you can see large angle of attack slides. Well, large angle of attack is just expected. You'll always see that. but. The fact that it's slipping back and forth indicates that the aerodynamics of it isn't stable. Seem to be maintaining only 15 degrees of pitch. And part of the wiggle is just it's struggling to keep that much. We're at 60 kilometers, 6,440 meters per second, 0.4 Gs. All right, we're at 55 kilometers. We started to go back up again. We are at 6,000 meters per second surface velocity, 0.5 Gs. We are headed back down, 56 kilometers, 5,670 meters per second. We are now below 50 kilometers. The radiator panels are reading overheated again. Nothing else though. Quite a lot of wiggle. The roll and yaw oscillations are very real. As we are at around 5,000 meters per second. 1G is what Jeb is experiencing. And we are off the west coast or south coast of Central America. Okay, well... So far, the only parts to actually blow up were the ore tanks, which were the only parts that weren't given space shuttle-like heat resistance. Um, I basically copied the max temp, skin max temp, and uh, reflectivity from the Mike NZ CSS space shuttle configurations in Realism Overhaul. So I just copied the same sort of uh, tolerances. And that's what we've got here. And I slapped it on everything. The fairings, the fuel tanks, the wings, the whole lot. They're all specially configured. Uh, for instance, the B9 procedural wing is uh, not seen anywhere else lunar rated version. Normally the best you can do is a space plane version of it. And again, of course, the Pika X procedural tanks. We have a serious side slip here. You can see we're very persistently deviating away, having a lot of roll. We're now at uh, about 4,000 meters per second. Still way too early to try and, you know, uh, go tail first. If we tried to do that now, uh, far would rip us apart, aerodynamic forces. But we are losing fuel here. So we'll have to reserve more in order to come back down safely. Looks like we'll uh, end up over water. Uh, before you ask, even though I uh, did put some aerodynamic control surfaces here, uh, this thing cannot fly.
so no, I can't splash down safely. That is not a reasonable thing to attempt. If I made the control surfaces substantially larger, then it might be possible. And if I had more fuel to work with to move around. Mm, yeah, I don't think the RCS is controlling this very well anymore. Nope. I think it, it wants to flip around. It uh, just doesn't have enough fuel to not flip around. Uh, let me see if I can... Because it's a little bit too early for that, like I said. Let me see if I can... No, that's not the tank I want. Uh, nope. Being a little bit hard to get to things. Uh, uh, structural integrity is getting rough. Mm. If we can survive just a little bit longer, I can try pumping the stuff into the tail and have it go tail first. We're still going like Mach 6, Mach 6. G-forces, well, with all this going on, no surprise, G-forces ended up going much higher than I was anticipating. If we can get below Mach 3, I, I, I'll try pumping the fuel down and go tail first. Quite a lot of shuddering. We are below Mach 3 now. Let me finish pumping that and but do we have enough fuel to have it orient the right way? I don't know. It's sort of falling like a leaf right now. And if we activate the engines, how much delta V do we have? 266. Well, yeah, we probably need more fuel down there than we have right now. Definitely not oriented the correct way. Definitely going nose down here. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I am. Hold on. Let me get Smarty SS off. SAS on. Oh, maybe Smart ASS was causing a problem. Well, it's a little bit too late for it to solve that problem now. Uh... So, on the bright side, we managed to bring it through the atmosphere. So that part, good. As far as actually trying to make a landing though, still some tweaking left to do. But uh, that's where I am. Uh, I have uh, successfully gotten a version of this that can pass through the atmosphere. Though not at Mars return speeds, at least through low Earth orbit return speeds. So anyway, on that note, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.